My name is Don Pusick. It's good to be back with you again this week. Uh, it's been a privilege to worship with you this morning, and it's always a privilege because our attention gets directed to the Lord himself. And the most important thing that can happen today or any service that you attend is that something happens to restore, clarify uh, your vision of Christ. It's just so essential that we recapture on a daily basis our sense of Jesus. Uh, this morning I want to talk to you about the relationship that Jesus wants to have with you. And it's rooted in what Jesus is going to share with us, speak to us through his word in John 14 and 15. But it's also rooted in the testimony of every Christian here who knows Jesus and has this relationship with him. And, and so... I want to call your attention to John chapter 14 and would encourage you to turn there in your Bibles or your device and some of this will be on the screen, some of it won't. So, and I don't hear a lot of Bibles turning, so let me just say this, this is not a rebuke, this is an encouragement, bring your Bible, okay, this is a church and God's word is absolutely vital, more vital than even what I may say about it, and so when we read the scripture together and study it together, God is about to speak to you. He's about to speak to you. Not because I'm particularly special, but because we're giving attention to his word. And, and so I just want to encourage you to come with that expectation and anticipation. Any service you go to, not just this church, but any, any that you go to. And um, if you don't have a Bible, want one, ask somebody here. I bet you they know they can find one for you and then help you out with that. So, in John chapter 14, we're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 16. I want to talk to you about the relationship that Jesus wants to have with you. Let me go ahead and read the text first, okay? John chapter 14, this is the night before Jesus is crucified. He has just washed the disciples' feet. And in this, and what he says next are essentially last words, things that are absolutely vital that they know before he leaves. And so, in this, in this particular context, uh, I believe that they were beginning to understand for the very first time that he was leaving. He had told them before this night, but now they're beginning to get it. They're beginning to understand. And so, we know that this disturbed them. We know it from other texts when he would say something like that, but we know it here because he opens up chapter 14 saying, let not your hearts be troubled. And so he wouldn't say, let not your hearts be troubled unless their hearts were troubled. Okay, great. Thank you. So their hearts were, were troubled, and so what he's saying in chapter 14 and what he's saying to them in chapter 15 is designed to, to cause anxiety to be minimal and to go away. That's his intention in what he's sharing. And so in this passage, right in the middle of this, there's this profound teaching about the relationship that Jesus wants to have with them after he's gone. And, and if I was going to summarize it, it's the same relationship they had before he left. The relationship that he had with them before he left is the same relationship he wants to have with them when he's gone. It's going to continue. So listen to what he says. We're just dropping right in the middle of this discussion. John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Okay, so he's leaving, but what he's giving to them is never going to leave. Ever. The helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, a powerful phrase, and I hope you remember that. I would underline it in my Bible. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Father, we rejoice in you. You've called us to rejoice always in you, to find our pleasure and your pleasure in this relationship that you've created for us to have. 
Lord, I ask that through your spirit and your presence here, you would make this a reality to every heart. For those who are hearing it for the first time, may, it, may this be a life-defining encounter with your truth. For those who have known this but maybe have forgotten it, may it be an awakening. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I came to know Jesus in the 1970s towards the tail end of what scholars today call the Jesus People Movement. Now, this is another test. They called it the Jesus People Movement because the focus of the movement was primarily about very good, A+. All right? So, so that was not just a label. It was actually a characteristic of that movement of God that took place in the United States. And I say it was characteristic because if you were involved in the life of what was happening at that moment in our history, then Jesus was indeed the focus of your heart and the focus of many of the hearts of the people that you encountered. We talk about Jesus. We talk to Jesus. We sing songs to Jesus. They were a little cheesy, but we, we sang the songs. Um, I came to know Christ in, in Dayton, Ohio. I say it was late in the Jesus People Movement because it took longer for it to get to Dayton, Ohio. And my dad was Air Force, and I was raised in another Christian tradition, but I did not know Jesus. And I came to know Christ in that, as, as a senior in high school and, and then went to the University of Texas in Austin to study. And while I was there, as a brand new believer, I mean, I had not been a Christian but for less than a year, and I just, if, if it had a Christian stamp on it, I was in it. I was talking to somebody the other day about, about reaching uh, students on campuses. I think it was you, Joe. We were talking about that, and I said, the, those buses would line up on Sunday morning. And I would just go down the open door. I'd say to the bus driver, what are y'all doing today? You know, are y'all having lunch with that? I was a college student. And I'd go down to the next bus. What are y'all doing today? Oh, you're having Josh McDowell. I'm coming on your bus. You know, I was, I was just a promiscuous church attender. I just went wherever they were doing it, whatever they had going on, I went. I think I joined two churches in one semester. I mean, it just, that was it. I was all about it. And learning, just, just sucking it up, everything I could, and meeting other Christians. It was so cool to meet other people who love Jesus. And, and um, I remember I would drive down to San Antonio. There was a, there was a Friday night Bible study. I, I grew up in San Antonio, and it was a church I, I got, that licensed me eventually and that I got involved with. And I'd go down Friday night, the youth pastor, we'd have Bible study in his home. And, and it was not a huge church, but... but Every student ministry was popping at the seams. And so on Friday nights in this Bible study in the youth pastor's home, it, easily there was 80, 90, 100 kids in a 1,500, 1,800 square foot house maybe. I mean, we were everywhere. We were sitting on everything, sitting on each other. He would sit in a chair and uh, would teach from the Bible in his lap, you know, and, and then we would sing and like I said, the songs, you know, they were cutting edge, contemporary Christian songs. And I'm telling you, they were as cheesy as the day is long, but they were wonderful to us, and we were singing them to the Lord. And, and then we would pray together, and everybody in the house would hold hands. So the, the, the hands being held would go down the hallway, into the bathroom, wherever people were sitting down, the kitchen, everybody holding hands, and just about everybody would pray. Not at once, either. One at a time. One would pray, then the next one would pray, and the next one would pray. And so you better be in a good position because your legs were going to sleep sitting there at that time. And then we get through, and one of the guys, he, I think he was a cowboy or something, he'd hop in the truck and say, hey, let's go talk to people about Jesus. So a bunch of us would climb in the back of the pickup. We'd drive downtown San Antonio, the Paseo de Rio, and we would talk to people about Jesus on the river walk. Just total strangers, airmen, people just walking around trying to have a good time, not wanting to be accosted by kids, but we would accost them. And, and, and we, were, we would have been considered Jesus fanatics, freaks. We didn't know any better because it was all about Jesus. 
Really didn't care what church you went to. I'm not saying that's okay. I'm just saying, you know, I did, the first thing I wanted to know about you was not your doctrinal statement. I wanted to know whether or not you knew Jesus. Jesus? Do you know him? And dear ones, as we've gotten further and further away from that season, you know, in Southern Baptist life, we baptized over 400,000 people a year from 1970 to 1975. Last year, it was barely 200,000, less than half that. From 1970-75, over a third of those baptisms were youth and young adults. We're not even close to that now as a percentage. I mean, God was at work. But it was about Jesus. And so here's what I want you to understand. When people come into this building, they aren't interested particularly in your, your statement of belief. Because it's just a statement of belief. Every church has that. So what? They're not interested necessarily in your budget or how successful you are at raising your budget every year. They're not particularly interested in your programming. Every church has programming. Bible studies, great. We act like it's a, a hot, hot thing, but everybody's got one. You know, some kind of group to plug in. And we call them different things. Life groups, Sunday school classes, Bible study groups, adult Bible fellowship. I mean, we have tons of names for these things. It's the same thing. Group people study the Bible together, and maybe they get along. But when someone comes in the door that doesn't know Christ, they're wanting to hear and have an encounter with Jesus. Not doctrine. Not organized church, organized religion. There's all kinds of research showing that people are turning away from organized church. Nothing new, but they're doing it in greater numbers now, and it's accelerating because they're not interested in this. They're interested in meeting someone who says, yeah, I know Jesus. Let me tell you about him. They want to know if you're the real deal or if you're just another fake who talks religious talk. And so we, have a, we, we, we do have a crisis on our hands, a lot bigger than anything you think you may have here as a church fellowship. It's much larger. I can, I can speak with some level of authority that it at least covers this continent that we're on, North America. I mean, 97% of the people coming to Christ, excuse me, 93% of the people coming to Christ around the world this morning, 93% of them will not be in North America or in Europe. 93% of the people coming to Christ will not be in North America or Europe. It'll be somewhere else. And it is one of the most amazing times in the history of the Christian church to be a Christian because more people are coming to faith in the hour that we spend together. Something like 3,000, 3,500 an hour around the world are coming to faith in Christ every hour of every day that you and I are alive. So just for the hour that we spend together, more people are coming to Christ than came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. That's the age in which we live, but we don't know anything about that because we live in North America where the church is choking on organizational stuff and we have forgotten Jesus. Jesus. And so the, the great question ought to be if someone came to you this morning and said, tell me, don't just tell me about your relationship to Jesus, tell me about this relationship that Jesus wants to have with me. Could you describe it? Could you define it? Could you explain it to somebody? So the disciples have this incredible moment in their journey with Jesus where for three and a half years, they did not have to figure anything out. They didn't have to figure out what we're going to do tomorrow. They didn't know what they were going to do tomorrow. They didn't have to figure out how they were going to eat, where they were going to go, where they were going to sleep. All they had to do was follow Jesus. Jesus took care of those things. Jesus, by his very presence, supplied to his disciples everything they needed 
to do everything he was calling them to do on that day. And then in this passage, he's saying to them, and that's going to continue. You never get away from that. You never graduate from following Jesus. You never get to where, I got this, Lord, I don't need your help. No, that never happens. We are in this relationship, and we follow a living Lord who has promised to supply to us everything we need to do everything he's called us to do. I, I told you to pay attention in verse 18 to that word orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. They were worried about what was going to happen next. If he's leaving, what happens? He says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. This is so significant in part because it's one of only two places in the New Testament where the word orphan is used. Only two. And in this context, he's using it on purpose. I mean, he could have used other words. He could have said, I won't leave you alone. I won't leave you to fend for yourselves. I won't leave you isolated and cut off from others. We're going to have a great church, guys. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put you all in a church. He didn't say that. He didn't say any of those things. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. So what does that mean? Well, then and now, to be an orphan was to be someone without a parent. Without a parent. And, and it was more serious in Jesus' day because they didn't have the programs and the, you know, foster families. They didn't have any of that kind of stuff. And so if you were an orphan in Jesus' day, there was no one to protect you, no one to teach you anything, no one to provide for you. You were on your own. And, and a lot of them didn't survive. And Jesus looks at these disciples and he says, you know what an orphan is? I'm not going to leave you like that. I'm not going to leave you like a parentless person. I'm going to leave you so that you do have someone to provide for you. You do have someone to protect you. You do have someone to teach you. I'm not going to leave you like an orphan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The problem comes in that too many Christians that I know are living like parentless people. They're living like orphans. So let's re-examine this. I want to share with you the relationship Jesus wants to have with you, and I want to build it around five words. Four, if we get short on time. This is one of those expandable sermons. And so I've got, I've got five words. We'll see if we get to number five, okay? But I got four and then five, that describe five simple words to describe the relationship that Jesus wants to have with you and every person that you meet. Okay, you ready for this? Here's the first word to describe the relationship. The word is spiritual. Spiritual. And we see this in verse 16. Jesus says, and I will pray or ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. And in the original language, literally, that means another of the same kind. Someone just like me. I will ask the Father to give you another helper that he may abide or stay with you forever. I'm leaving, but he's never going to leave. And properly understood, what he's saying here is that the Holy Spirit will be with you in heaven through all eternity. I mean, we take the Bible literally, right? So he's going to abide with you forever. You're never going to be without the Holy Spirit. When you trusted Jesus, Holy Spirit came inside, he's with you forever. And I say that on the authority of what Jesus said. Okay? And who is this? The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. And so immediately I understand that the relationship that Jesus wants to have with me and with you is not a physical relationship. He's not here physically. He's, it's not a physical relationship, it is a spiritual relationship. And I spent several years in Southern California, and I can tell you right now that the way they use the word spiritual and the way the Bible uses it are not the same thing. You know, they look at, they look at some guy who's a little sensitive, oh, he's spiritual. Or they look at somebody else, they could be a Buddhist or whatever, they say, oh, they're spiritual. And, and, and yet the Bible never uses the word spiritual in that term, in that way. 
The word spiritual means of or having something to do with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And so what we need to recognize is that the Holy Spirit is God. We say we believe in the Trinity, but we don't talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. And yet the Holy Spirit is so important, he plays right now the most important role in your life as a Christian. I can't think of any, any other dimension of who God is that is more important to you this morning than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is not an it. May the force be with you. I mean, he's not that. In fact, every time the Holy Spirit is referred to in the Bible, it's referred to with a masculine pronoun, he or him. And it speaks to him being a person. A person. So there's God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, one God. And the Holy Spirit is God. He speaks. You don't have to read very far in the book of Acts to see that the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said, over and over again in the book of Acts. Some people say, well, that doesn't count for today. Well, who gave you the right to say that? How can you possibly say the Holy Spirit doesn't speak anymore? Really? Jesus is trying to comfort his disciples. And, uh, and then we see this on display after Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes. And so he says, he says to him, you know, the Spirit, he's going to be for you, gentlemen, all that I would be if I were here in person. So the Holy Spirit's role is to mediate to you and to me the person, the presence, the life, the power, the wisdom of God in the person of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit mediates that to us. We have the mind of Christ, Paul would later say. That's why. We literally have the mind of Christ. And so, man, when he said, I'm not leaving you as orphans, he was serious, wasn't he? So the relationship is spiritual. It has to do with the Holy Spirit mediating to me the presence and life of Jesus. There's a second word to describe the relationship Jesus wants to have with you. The first one is spiritual. The second one is internal. Internal, meaning on the inside. Look at the end of verse 17. But you know him, the Holy Spirit, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. At this time, the Holy Spirit did not indwell the disciples, but after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did come inside. We talked about this last week at Easter. The Holy Spirit comes in, unites with the human spirit. We become a new creation, a new creature in Christ. That happened at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came. And every follower of Jesus Christ who had trusted him to save them from their sins, and, the, and they had trusted him to have directional control of their life, the Holy Spirit came to live inside them. And so suddenly I begin to realize that the, whole, the, the relationship God wants to have with me is spiritual, so it has to do with the Holy Spirit, but he puts the Holy Spirit inside me. And so now I realize there's a relationship that God wants to have with me is not out here. It's in here. It's inside. When I talk to God, it's in my inside. It's internal. So if you're the kind of person who's busy, 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 the kind of person who always has to have the TV on or radio going, or even in the car when you're alone, if you're the kind of person that's always surrounded by external noise and all your inputs are external, you are not going to have the relationship that Jesus wants you to have. You're going to have to shut all that down. Shut that out. Jesus taught later in, in, on prayer in Matthew 6, he said, when you pray, go into your room and close the door. You're shutting out all those inputs, all those external things. Close the door, and your Father who sees in secret, your Father who wants to be alone with you, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. If you go to a a university or a seminary, sometimes you'll hear these debates or read articles where people are debating how you and I are composed on the inside, how we're made up on the inside. And I'm not talking about your physical self. 
but your immaterial self, the part that I can't see, but it's your consciousness, your mind, you know, your will, your choice, all these different things. And so some people will argue that you and I are a duality. We have a body and a soul. Others will argue that we're tripartite beings, that we have body, soul, and spirit. And for the purpose of what Jesus is teaching us in this moment, none of that matters. And, and so let me give you a verse that I think helps with that discussion, that question mark. 2 Corinthians 4.16. I just want to read it. You can mark it down if you're taking notes. 2 Corinthians 4.16. Paul writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing. How many of you all understand your outward man is perishing? I, I know mine is. Okay. Though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So you have, every person here, Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter. You have an outer self and you have an inner self. And Jesus is saying, I, the relationship I want to have with you is in your inner self. It's in your inner self. And so you can use your imagination, which is part of your inner self, by the way. You can use your imagination and think of it as two chairs in your heart. One you sit in, Jesus sits in the other. Uh, another way to think about it is, is to imagine a door here on the platform, and on this side of the door is Don's outer self, and then I open the door and I close it, and then I'm dealing now with Don's inner self. The problem is we're surrounded with so much external stuff. How often do we stop and begin to deal on the inside with God in our inner selves? If I go outside my outer self, that's what you see and that's what I see. And, and you are constantly receiving information through your eyes, your ears, your fingers, your taste, your smell, all these senses that you have, and, and you're taking in all the external stuff, but God says, the relationship I want to have with you is not through these external inputs. The relationship I want to have with you is in here, your inner self. You're just going to have to chew on that one. I do know this, that, and it doesn't matter when you do it, but sometime every day, I prefer the morning. I think that's best. You're doing exactly what you need to do if you shut everything out and you get alone with the Lord. And when I'm alone with the Lord and I'm talking to him, I'm not talking to him up there or over there. I'm talking to him here. And what I find is that it's that, in that inner conversation that begins my day, that when I'm through with that and I go out into the rest of my day, it's still there. That sense of communion with him and intimacy with him and connection to him and conversation with him remains throughout the rest of the day. And so through, no matter what's happening, I'll get a phone call, someone comes to my office, they say, Don, I have a problem, and immediately I find that he's still there. I just turn to him in my inner self. I don't even have to say anything, but the attitude of my heart, my inner self, is towards him. And they start telling me their problem, but while they're telling me their problem and I'm listening to them, I'm listening to him. And sometimes I'm talking to him while they're talking to me. I'm not being rude. I'm just saying, Jesus, help me, which is my favorite prayer, by the way. How do you want me to respond to this dear one who's sharing with me? Sometimes he brings things to mind. Sometimes he brings a scripture to mind. Sometimes he gives me a sense of what to do next with this person or how to respond. I mean, it's what he promised he would do. I will not leave you as orphans. And so the relationship he wants to have with you is spiritual, it's internal. Let me give you a third word. The third word is environmental. The relationship he wants to have with you involves your entire environment around you. And so we see this down in verse 20, the last verse I read. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And that day is when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So again, use your imagination, which is part of your inner self, and imagine for me the Father as being a large circle. Now that's not fair because there are no boundaries to the Father, right? Right? There's no place I can go where he's not. 
but just for the sake of thinking about what Jesus is saying, just draw a mental circle around me up here on the platform. That's the Father, okay, the Father. Jesus said, in that day you will know that I am in my Father. So draw another circle just inside the Father is another circle. We'll call that Jesus. Jesus is in the Father. In that day you will know that I am in my Father. And then he says, and you in me. So suddenly, I have my own circle in this mix. There's the Father, and inside the Father is the Son, and inside the Son is whoever Jesus is talking to, the Christian, me. And then he says, and I and you. So we've added a fourth one. So there's the Father, and inside the Father is Jesus, and inside Jesus is you and me, and inside me and you, if you know Christ, is Jesus. You know how incredibly safe you are because of that truth. Nothing can get to you that doesn't first go through the Father and then through the Son. Nothing. Jesus has become your environment if you're a Christian. The very air you breathe. You are in Christ. And, and he so much saturates your life. He's in you, not just around you. He's in you. So when you lose your mind, and again, nobody has to raise their hand and say, that's me. But when you get scrambled in your head, Jesus is in there too. That's why the psalmist would write Psalm 73, though my flesh and my heart may fail, my inner self, my outer self, even though those things fail, he's still there. He is faithful. And so he becomes our environment. That's why Jesus could say, in the world you will have trouble, tribulation, but be of good cheer. In the midst of this Hostile world, because I have overcome the world. Well, why is that significant? Because the one who overcame the world, you are in Christ. And so let's just imagine for a moment, I'll pick on Joe. Joe's been busy this week. He and a team have been doing some missions over in Alabama, wasn't it? And so that they were doing that this week. So let's say Joe and I go down the Lake Poncha train this afternoon and we're going to have a contest. Joe's a competitive guy, and so he and I are going to have a competition to see if we go under the water in Lake Pontchartrain, who can hold their breath the longest. How many would like us to see, see that happen this afternoon? We could all go out together down to the lake. Yeah, Carrie, come on, buddy. And so we'll go down to the lake, and Joe and I, with everybody watching, somebody with a stopwatch, we're going to see who can hold their breath the longest. And so we both go under the water. And we wait, and we wait, and wait. Somebody's ticking off the seconds on a stopwatch. And then, honestly, I don't know. I don't know if Joe would outlast me or if I would outlast Joe. But one of us would pop up first, and then I guarantee you the other one's coming up soon. All right? Here's the point. Did you know that water is a hostile environment? You can't live underwater. I hope that's not news to you. But you can't, you can't live underwater. It's a hostile environment. And so we can't live there. That's not where we can do life. But if I had a snorkel, I could cheat. <laughs> if I had a snorkel, that tube, I could, the top of it's above the water, I could access my environment and get access to air. And even though I'm in a hostile environment, because I had access to my environment, I'd be okay. Or, better yet, get some scuba tanks, scuba gear, and I have a respirator, I can breathe. And, uh, and so I just take my environment with me into the water, and I can go deep and swim wherever I want, stay down there quite a while. Why? Because I have my environment with me. If you go into outer space, if you step out of a space capsule without a space suit, depending on which movie you watch, you blow up or freeze, or both. Because why? Space is a hostile environment. Space is a hostile environment. And so, but if I have the astronaut suit with temperature being regulated and oxygen and all kinds of bells and whistles, I can go out into that hostile environment and I am absolutely okay because I'm taking my environment with me. Jesus said, I'm your environment. And dear one, over 160 times, I mentioned this last week, over 160 times in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul refers to you and me as being in Christ. I went in and looked up the verses I, I mentioned last week. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. just listen. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, 
to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Did you hear it? To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. They're not just in Philippi, are they? They're in Christ in Philippi. And Paul writes that just opening the letter. He wants them to know this. Colossians 1 verse 2. To the saints and faithful, faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. They're not just in Colossae. They're in Christ in Colossae. He writes in Philemon verse 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. So where are they? They're in prison. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. So they're not just in prison, they're in Christ in prison. So I don't know what you're dealing with today, but if you're a Christian today, you truly know him, you're in Christ in those circumstances. You're not just at Woodland Park Baptist Church today, you're in Christ in Woodland Park Baptist Church. You're not just in Hammond or Ponchatoula or Covington or wherever you're from, you're in Christ before you're in those places. I told last hour I was driving down the road. I drive up and down I-12 all the time because I have churches from Slidell to the halfway to Baton Rouge. And um, one day I was driving and this car blew past me like I was standing still. They must have been going 85, 90 miles an hour. Happens all the time. But what made this kind of remarkable is I noticed they had a personalized license plate that said in Christ on it. Now, personally, I believe they were grieving the Holy Spirit at that moment, all right? But they were in Christ in the car speeding down the freeway at 85 miles an hour, if they were Christian. They were in Christ. Even when they mess up, they're in Christ. And, and, and Jesus wants us to understand that going forward. We don't see him physically, but we are surrounded by Jesus, and he lives inside. Last word I want to give you. We'll go ahead and do word number five. Is that okay? Is that okay? So to describe the relationship Jesus wants to have with us, first of all, it's spiritual. It has to do with the Holy Spirit living in us. Number two, it's internal. It's not out here, it's in here. Number three, it's environmental. He is our environment. And, and uh, number four, oh, there's two more words. Number four is personal. Okay, number four is personal. And I, I call your attention back to verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. There's our word. But then he says, I will come to you. That's personal. He's not going to send somebody else to those disciples. He says, when I'm gone, I will come to you. Now listen to what he says next. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. And you've got to put it all together to understand what Jesus just said. Because we've already established the relationship is not physical, correct? It's spiritual. It's internal. And so when he says, the world won't see me, but you will see me, he's not referring to physical sight, is he? He's not referring to physical sight. He's referring to inner vision. An inner beholding of him. Who he is, what he's about what he's doing, what he's saying, how he's leading, you will see Jesus in your inner self. And everyone, that's where we, what we most need to happen in, among churches in North America. We need to restore our vision of Christ. It's because we've lost sight of him that we get in the messes that we get into. When the Spirit is filling a person's life, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'm just saying the relationship is personal. He, he says, I will come to you. So let me get to the last word. Describing the relationship Jesus wants to have with you, the last word is fruitful. Fruitful. He doesn't want to just, you know, have you sit around and sing songs in your closet. That is beautiful, and we should praise him in the closet. But he wants your life to bear fruit. And so as he's talking to the disciples about this relationship and he's explained to them it's going to be spiritual, it's going to be internal, it's going to be environmental, it's going to be personal, they were not the sharpest knives in the bucket. And, and, and to their credit, they were upset. 
They were concerned about what was taking place. And so it's almost as if Jesus looks at their faces and says, hey, guys, let me just, let me, let me just draw a picture of what I'm talking about. I'm the vine, you're the branches. This is how it works. I don't know how to make it any easier. He puts it as low-hanging fruit, no pun intended. He puts it on the low shelf, and he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Listen to chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, remains in me, has communion with me, is intimate with me. He who who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now he's saying this to guys that have been following him for three and a half years. That's why they were concerned because they thought they were going to be without him. They knew they couldn't do anything without him. In Mark 9, they tried to cast out a demon without him. They couldn't do it. They knew they needed Jesus. And he still operates that way today. We can't do anything without him as believers, as churches. And so this is what he says. I'm the vine, you're the branches. So how does this work? Well, the vine is absolutely essential, right? So the vine... And you and I are the branches, so the vine and the branch are connected to one another in a, in a healthy, living situation. And if everything's working the way it's supposed to, everything the branch needs to produce fruit comes up through the vine. All the moisture, all the life, all the nutrients, everything comes up through the vine. It goes out through the branch, and then fruit is produced. But if that if that branch is cut off from the vine, there's no fruit. There's also no life in the branch. So literally, everything that branch needs is supplied by the vine before fruit can be born. That's why he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So people go to school, they get degrees, they study, they memorize scripture, they do all these kinds of things. But without Christ, you can't do anything. And, and the kind of fruit that's produced, certainly fruit includes new believers, but it also includes a, an entirely new expression of life. Paul would later say the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so you can see someone who's full of God where the life of the vine is flowing through that individual because you see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You see the life of Christ exhibited in that individual. Now, none of us are are 100%. We have to walk in the Spirit, Paul would later say. Walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh, your carnal desires, that part of you that wants to get your way and destroy your opposition. You have to walk in the Spirit so that doesn't happen. It's another way of talking about abiding in Christ. And so we've we've got to back up here. When Jesus said, abide in me, he wasn't offering a suggestion. He said, this is how it happens. This is the relationship I want to have with you. And and he said it as a command. It's like an order. Guys, do this, he says. Abide in me. Because I want you to be fruitful. I want you to exhibit my life. I'm not going to be there physically. Physically. Because I'm putting my Holy Spirit in you and he's going to mediate to you the presence and life of me. We're going to see some things happen. Just like happened when I was here on earth physically. We're going to see some really beautiful things take place. Can I ask you to bow your heads please and close your eyes. Thank you for your attentiveness and your patience. We're going to have a time of response. And... um, You know, if you're a believer today, you know that you know that you trusted Jesus and the Holy Spirit came to live inside you. and You trusted in his death for you on the cross and all your sins were carried away. You know that happened. But dear one, did anyone ever teach you how to walk in this new life? Did anyone ever explain to you that Jesus is Lord of every Christian? That you just didn't get your ticket punched so you go to heaven 
that he died so that he could be your Lord and have directional control of your life and so that you could follow him and experience him just like those disciples did 2,000 years ago. This is the very heart of the new life that Jesus came to give us. I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This is the heart of it. A relationship with him. And so if you're a believer today and you understand this, I would just say, Lori, that's great. I just rejoice with you. If you're a believer today and, and you're realizing, hey, I kind of heard some of this, but I'm realizing now there's more, much more. And I want that relationship. You could just talk to the Lord in this response time and just say, Lord, I realize now you want much more of me than I ever imagined. And so, Lord, I'm trusting you to give me that relationship that you want to bring into my life where it's not all on me anymore. Lord, I realize today I'm not an orphan. I'm not a parentless person, but you are still there for me. You lead me and guide me and supply to me everything I need to do everything you've called me to do. Lord, I don't want to waste another minute. Lord, would you give me that life? Direct me. Show me. how to have what that preacher just talked about, how to walk with you in a real way. If you're not a Christian today and you don't know that Jesus died for you on the cross and carried away your sins, I would just invite you to put your trust in Christ today based on his sacrifice for you. The Bible says when he died on the cross, he was taking your place taking the punishment your sins deserve so that he could give you this new life that we just talked about. This is the way God invented you. This is the way he designed you to live, was in a relationship with him. So he sent his son to die and carry away the, your sins. That's what's standing in the way. That and your own willful efforts to be in charge of your own life, you just got to give that up. Say, Lord, I yield to you. I give up my life to you. I'm trusting you to forgive me, but I'm also trusting you to change me. I want that relationship. And today, when we respond, right where you are sitting or when we're standing and others are singing, you can just talk to the Lord, just like I did just now, that kind of language from your own heart. And just, just respond to what he's saying to you. Respond to his invitation to you. steps are open if it helps you to come forward and to kneel I know sometimes I just have to get up and do that and it's just my way of saying Lord I heard what you said to me and my answer is yes and if that helps you feel free to do that if you need to talk to someone pray with someone I'm here I'll be here after the service Father thank you Lord for these moments that we've shared together thank you for these dear ones who have heard your scripture and your teaching commit these moments to you and may your Holy Spirit have your way among us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.